We suffer for a reason. But it's not just one reason. There are lots of different kinds of reasons. I mean, there's one word that covers them all, craving. But there are lots of different cravings in the mind. Which means that we need lots of different tools to use against those cravings. The Buddha classified them in two broad areas. He said some forms of the cause of suffering will go away simply when you watch them. You just sit there and look at them. Then they'll go away. Others, though, won't go away that way, either because they're stronger or more subtle. But they require that we, we do some fabrication. The main kinds of fabrication the Buddha talked about are directed thought and evaluation, and feeling and perception. Although the breath also comes under the topic of fabrication. The way you breathe relate in relationship to some things actually will change your relationship to them. This is why he starts meditation with the breath, getting to know the breath, getting on familiar terms with it, and experimenting with it, learning how to breathe in and out through the whole body. Be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. Learning how to calm the breath, how to breathe in ways that give rise to ease, breathe in ways that give rise to rapture. How to breathe in ways where you can really observe the mind very clearly. This is a kind of fabrication, and it's an important skill to have in your arsenal. An important tool to have in your toolbox. Because as you get to know the way you breathe, you begin to get to know what's in the mind. Because the breath is a mirror of the mind. Fluctuations. Changes in the mind will cause fluctuations and changes in the breath. But the causal pattern works the other way as well. You change the way you breathe, and it can have an impact on the mind. That's why it's good to know how to calm the breath in the face of anger, in the face of fear. In the face of any emotion that threatens to overcome the mind. So it's one of the tools that's good to master. But you need other tools as well. This is where directed thought and evaluation come in. On the one hand, you use them to bring the mind to concentration. They're factors in the first jhana. Direct the mind to the breath, evaluate the breath. That right there is a kind of fabrication. It's a good tool to have. Because it's a normal, normal thinking process, the normal verbalization process in the mind. You think about something and then you evaluate it, you pass judgment on it, you play with it. You use your ingenuity. All that comes under evaluation. And it's a process we're using all the time, but oftentimes it works against us. We think and evaluate in ways that cause suffering rather than putting an end to suffering. So what we're trying to do is take that problem and learn to convert it to our to better uses. In other words, you create a state of concentration, and this brings in the perception and the, the feeling as well. You learn how to identify certain comfortable feelings in the body and work with them, solidify them, solid, solid, consolidate them, steady them. So you can use them as your allies. And you learn to keep that perception of breath in mind. Or when the breath gets so still that you can't follow it anymore, you can think with whole body, space. In other words, these are other ways of perceiving, but they become tools as you develop your powers of concentration.
because otherwise we can perceive way, things in ways that cause us a lot of anguish. Feelings rise up and you grab all of the pain, grab all of the anguish, identify with it, so that your breathing and your directed thought and your evaluation and your feelings and your perceptions all contribute to suffering. So as we practice, we're learning to take these things and convert them to another use, to help put an end to suffering. As you learn to keep a steady perception in mind, as you learn to keep your thoughts directed to one thing consistently, that's a healthy thing to think about, a helpful thing to think about as well. And you create a state of concentration from which, if you want, you can just look at things. You see thoughts arise and pass away, and they really pass away. They're gone. But you find other thoughts arise and pass away, and they keep coming back, coming back, coming back. That requires that you dig a little deeper. And this is where you take all the tools that you've used in developing concentration, the breath, directed thought, evaluation, perception, feeling, and you turn them on the issues of why is that particular thought, why is that particular emotion so persistent? Where is the attachment that keeps digging for it and bringing it out? Simply watching the thought come and go and come and go and come and go does will not always work. This is why the Buddha said that Purification of the mind doesn't come through equanimity, it comes through discernment. You have to understand the coming, understand the going. And the first thing is to learn how to distance yourself from it. That's why the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not-self are so important. The thought that seemed to be deeply embedded in the mind. When you really look at it, you see that it comes and it goes, and even when it's there, it vacillates. It's not always consistent. It's not always steady. You miss that because your own mind wasn't steady. Your directed thought and your evaluation, your perceptions weren't steady. But if you learn how to steady them, you begin to see the unsteadiness and these other things in the mind. That should serve as a warning signal. Okay, this is something that you can't really depend on, you can't really identify with it. And as you look into the comings and goings, you see there's stress. Another good reason not to identify with it. And when you see that you don't have to identify with it and it's stressful, why would you want to identify with it? That's when you let it go. Or at the very least, you get some more distance on it. That you can look at it more objectively. So it's not the the me or the I that's feeling the pain, or the me or the I that's feeling the fear. There's just fear present. There's just anger present. And that's when you can really look at it. That's not the end of the matter. That's when discernment really can get to look at it. What is the underlying attachment here, the underlying misunderstanding about these thoughts that keeps them firmly embedded? And you've got the tools to work with it. But this doesn't mean you're working on these issues all the time. As we mentioned this afternoon, there are times when the mind really needs to rest. Just take your tools and turn around and make them tools for concentration. So the mind can gain not only a sense of ease and respite, but it can gain the steadiness and a sense of well-being that enables you to turn and look at those thoughts again without feeling overwhelmed by them. And without their dragging you into their mood. So when the mind is rested enough, you take the tools and you turn them around and use them as tools for analysis. This is why the Buddha never made a sharp distinction between Developing concentration and gaining insight. He says, insight requires two qualities of mind. It requires tranquility and it requires, excuse me, concentration requires two qualities of mind. Tranquility and insight. Just to get the mind to settle down. It's not that you can just 
force the mind or lullaby the mind into concentration. You need to understand it to at least some extent so it can stay focused on one topic without getting duped by its normal tendency to wander off. And once the mind gets more solidly concentrated, more solidly centered like this, then the tranquility gets greater and the opportunity for getting, gaining insight gets sharper. The less you stir up the water of the mind, the more clearly you can th see the things that are there in the water. It's one of the standard images. To see the Four Noble Truths, it's like seeing, they say, a clear, still pool of water in a mountain. You see the fish and the, and the rocks very, very clearly because the water is still. Why is the water still? Because you're not stirring it up. And when you're still, you can see even the slightest movements in the mind. You catch yourself, oh, I had that assumption. Oh, I was doing this that caused stress, and I didn't have to. In this way, you can let go of more and more refined attachments, more and more refined intentions in the mind, even skillful intentions. It comes to a point where you have to let go of what's skillful as well. That's when the mind opens up to something else entirely. Something is outside even of the, pr the present moment. And that's true liberation. When the mind is truly pure. You get there through discernment. And discernment, of course, needs other qualities to help it along. Concentration is an important one. Mindfulness. Alertness. All the factors play their part, but it's the insight, it's the understanding, it's the discernment that's going to make the difference. An important part of developing that discernment is learning to, one, master the tools of the mind so they're not creating suffering, and then secondly, knowing when to use them, when to use them to create calm in the mind, when to use them just to stay very, very still. And then when to use them to actively analyze things, understand them, probe. And the mind will reach a point where it knows that it, the work is complete. But until that time, you have to keep your tools sharpened. You have to keep exploring new ways in which to use those tools, like the simile of the raft. When you get to the other side of the stream, Okay, you can let the raft go. But while you're still crossing the stream, you can't let it go, because you'll get swept downstream. So you hold on to the raft. You work with your tools. You try to understand them, learn to master them, and get a better and better sense of when they're useful for stillness, when they're useful for analysis. And it's in that way that we get it over and beyond the causes of suffering. We uproot the causes of suffering. Simply watching them doesn't do it. Because you can get stuck just on that one tool. And anybody who has been a fighter who has only one trick up his sleeve will find out that he gets pummeled from all sides. You have to have lots of tricks. You have to have lots of approaches. Your central approach is developing concentration, but then it's learning how to use those tools of concentration in lots of different ways, through your own exploration, through your own ingenuity. That's what enables you to get rid of the causes of suffering on all sides. <laughs>